They look like a crustacean. They look like they're, they're from Middle Earth, you know, they're, they're sort of hunched, sort of lobster-like in some ways. They're adapted for life underground. It's the sound of heat, quintessentially summer, deafening cicadas. The sound is accompanied by an icy pole and the soft drift of moist droplets hitting your arms from the trees above. Now, I've always considered that to be cicada pee, and it turns out it is. And that sort of epitomises my relationship with cicadas, I think. Equal parts wonder and nostalgia and a dose of horror and irritation. Anne Jones with you and hundreds of cicadas today on Off Track. Cicadas' eyes sit so far apart that they almost look like the insect version of a hammerhead shark. Delicate wings, pointy legs, and a large abdomen shaped like a teardrop, where the pointy bit is their bottom, and the thick bit is their beefy head. And they come in all sorts of colours, but I don't know why I'm bothering to tell you what they look like, because the main way we relate to cicadas is via their sound. They're not crickets. They're cicadas. Dr Lindsay Popple is an entomologist with a very keen interest in cicadas and today he's our guide through the underground and relatively saucy world of the superfamily Cicadoidea. We're also going to hear his field recordings of the insects. That is a choir of some of the most common cicadas in Australia which appear between October and December each year to sing. You might know this species as the green grocer. Great name, isn't it? Greengrocer. So it's like a lot of cicada names. It's the depiction of how they look. They're bright green in colour. They're a bit of a, a distinctive looking cicada. They've, they've got sort of red or dull red eyes. Their head's quite angulated. But otherwise, yeah, they're bright green all, all over with um, transparent wings. There's another morph called the Yellow Monday, which is yellow. And there's a very rare form called the Blue Moon, I know some avid cicada collectors. Each year they'll go and look for cicadas. Occasionally they'll find this blue moon, but they're pretty sought after. There's another form that's brown. I call that the chocolate soldier. And then there's another form that's mostly up in the mountainous country called the masked devil. And it is yellow and black on the head and the thorax and mainly black on the abdomen. We've got green grocer, yellow Monday, Blue Moon, Chocolate Soldier, Mask Devil. They're such poetic names. Yes, um, and there are lots of names that are sort of been inspired by the way that cicadas look. Another one would be Flowery Baker, which is a strange cicada that tends to sit upside down. Uh, also, They also call it Flowery Miller because it looks a bit like uh, someone who's just been b baking bread all morning and they've come back covered in flour <laughs> because they've really they'd look dusty. Some species are also named after what they sound like. How about this creaking branch cicada? All the species sing differently, but more on that later. The adult greengrocer is the cicada that you're most likely to have heard and the emerald beauty has a complex life cycle. After some months in the egg, a tiny nymph cicada hatches out and makes its way down the plant the eggs were on right to the ground. Then it starts to burrow, digging a tunnel to a tree root where it latches on for a feed of sap. Mm, I was going to say, like a child to the breast, get all poetic, but really it's way more gruesome than that. The nymphs have a rostrum through which they feed. It's a special proboscis, a thick needle-like protrusion that penetrates the roots and sucks the xylem. As its nymphal stages pass, the greengrocer becomes quite fat and brown and hunched over. Its front two legs are much larger than the others and are a bit like lobster claws. The insect at this stage looks like a stereotypical ageing butler, the hunchbacked assistant to Dr Frankenstein, as if it would grovel along and say, yes, master, when addressed. They're made for the subterranean world and they'll stay under there for years at a time. Dr Lindsay Popple. I suspect that underground 
they're very mobile in that soil environment. I have actually put a cicada nymph in a, in a sort of a terrarium to see what it did around the plant roots, and and they're really amazing. You know, you pull them out of the ground, and they're, they're sort of that they're all bent over, and they're sort of hopeless. They sort of stumble around it. You look at them and think that that thing, how does it survive? But underground, they're in their domain and they basically backfill their burrows. They can do flips in these tunnels underground and they, they move through the tunnels. So they, they need to be able to move away from potential flooding events underground. They need to sustain air pockets to stay alive. They also need to maintain a food source at all times on the plant roots. They're very different for example, to say uh, moth or wasp pupae. See, the cicadas don't really have a pupil stage. They have multiple instars, which is basically developmental stages of nymph. And as they get bigger, they shed. They're adapted for life in the soil underground. And But specifically for greengrocer, prior to emergence, they form these turrets at the surface. And... If, if you're looking around, you'll see these holes in the garden with, with a bit of a mound around them. And this is just something that happens a few days before they finally actually emerge. Does it just crawl its way over to the nearest tree? What happens then? They crawl out of the ground. They just sort of scurry along, not too quickly usually, and, and make their way to a point where they can anchor themselves securely, which is a critical stage, actually, because they're very vulnerable once they actually are emerging, coming out of the shell. You know, if, if the shell gets knocked and the, and the nymph falls down while its wings are growing, those wings will be permanently ruined. So moving from, from the burrow onto the tree is a, quite a critical step in, in ensuring that they actually get to reproduce. So if you're underground for seven years and you crawl and you climb up onto a, a twig and you think that'll do and then the twig breaks off and you land on the ground, that's it, you're done, basically. <laughs> And what we see on the trees, what, what people notice in terms of seeing cicadas is usually just the shells that they leave and the final molt. People don't often see the adults themselves, they'll just find the shells. The final molt process is absolutely engrossing and sort of horrifying to watch. The Igor-like nymph will latch onto a tree and then a split appears lengthways down its back, an escape hatch through the exoskeleton. From within the head appears another head, pushing up out of the nymph shell like that dome-headed extraterrestrial that emerges from Sigourney Weaver's stomach in the movie Alien. It's a bit grotesque. The adult cicada has essentially been wearing the nymph's skin as a costume for the last couple of days of its life. And let me tell you, the adult is quite a bit bigger than the nymph. It pushes and pulls and the gaping chasm across the shell's back gets wider and wider. At some stage, the cicada pulls back out of the shell with its rear still stuck inside. And for a split second, it looks like the much bigger adult insect is riding the nymph like a pony while swinging a lasso. Then it emerges, moist, soft and complete. Its wings are magically inflated with fluid and shortly after, they harden. Those wings are slightly longer than the body and they have a delicate look of rice paper laced with veins. So do they use those handsome wings to get around? Some species are more mobile than others. For example, the American periodical cicadas, they're the ones with amazing life cycles, 17 years and 13 years underground. Basically, because they've received a lot of attention and research, they thought it would be a good idea to do some radio tracking of the cicadas, so they, they did that, and they found that those particular individuals actually climbed up onto the tree, grew wings, got to the top of the tree, stayed there for the duration of their life, and then dropped down dead. But I think, in general, cicadas are actually quite capable of moving long distances when required. It depends on the species. The small grass cicadas are quite delicate, so they're probably more limited in their dispersal ability, but I think the larger ones, they've got quite well-developed wings, so they can... They can take off and fly a few hundred metres at a time when, when needed. Even though the greengrocer's range overlaps with the habitation zone of the majority of the Australian human population and the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of the things every season, you are much more likely to have heard them rather than to have seen them. They have an incredible, iconically summer-themed song. Well, it's quite a... 
it's quite a shrill sound, metallic. Um, it's it's a medium pitch, and it's a, basically a whine. And then and then they'll also go into a pulsing phase, so sort of, sort of like a revving phase where they make distinct, discrete notes, like chirping in the song. But it's very it's very robust. They can get up to about 120 decibels, I believe. That's that's actually almost loud enough, really, to do damage to your ears. Well, I think it would if you stayed around that noise source for long enough, potentially, yes, because it's basically like standing next to a jet engine, and if you've got multiple individuals surrounding you, then, <laughs> yes, you can imagine that it's very loud. Well, the bigger cicadas have this habit of uh, aggregating, so where you get one male calling, usually where, where the first male is calling, you tend to get a whole heap of other cicadas exhibiting this thing called phonotaxis where they fly into where that other calling male is and they're able to sort of hone in on the sound. If you were another bloke and you heard a male singing, why would you go over to where he's singing? Wouldn't you want to go somewhere else so you could attract the females over to you? It's quite a complex system with the big cicadas. It's still a little bit kind of subtle in some ways because it seems that you have a a male or a group of males that are singing, and then the females are sort of hanging around them. And there's limited observation on this, but it looks basically like when there's a female been hanging around with a male singing for a while, at some point the male walks up and sort of gives her a nudge. And if she stays there and is receptive, they will start mating. But there's been some observation of males that are just sitting there, not calling, and then they've got a female near them, that's been attracted to another calling male and they'll walk up to the female even though they're not singing and nudge the female and the female will agree to mate with them so so that's called that's called lecking lecking the males are the ones that sing and they're trying to attract a mate it might not be your idea of a sweet serenade but then you're not a female cicada they don't all bust out the same pulsing rhythm that you just heard the green grocer drumming out either. Each species has their own sound. This is a golden emperor doing his best to attract a mate. Did you hear that variation in his song? He's yodelling. If I slow it right down, you might be able to hear his singing abilities a little bit better. How do they make the sound? They've got a specialised organ on either side of the body at the junction of the abdomen and the thorax. It's basically a, a membrane, OK? And the membrane is made up of this protein called resolin, which is a very high-energy protein. Uh, to give an illustrated example, dragonflies in their wing muscles at the base of the wings, they, they, they've got resolin, so it's, it's quite rubber-like and able to sustain prolonged movement. So they've got these muscles that are attached to this membrane that's full of resolin, and on the outside of the membrane is a series of sclerotized ribs, and the muscles buckle the membrane, um, which causes those ribs to buckle, and, and the sound emanates from that and is amplified by the surrounding structures, including the abdomen, so they use their own body as a sort of a little speaker. That's right. So their body is an amplifier, and they can they can move their abdomen to modulate the song, which means they can change the tone and pitch of the song by, by body movements while they're singing. Have a listen to this granite squeaker. Its call is actually bitonal. Let's slow it down. What a sweet love song. I mean, he's no Pavarotti, but it's interesting to hear now that you know he's changing notes by wiggling his body. Lindsay Popple is with us today, an entomologist whose professional passion is cicadas. We've just heard a couple of love songs from male cicadas trying to attract a mate, but what happens to all those cicadas after they've had sex? So basically, once, once mating has taken place... There's a bit of unknown about whether the female will mate multiple times or not, and that may be dependent on the species. After a while, she will then go and land on a substrate that she recognises as being suitable for laying the eggs in. So some species will lay in dead timber, others will lay in living timber, some will lay in the trunks of trees, 
Others will lay on in, in the twigs, in grass, small shrubs. There's various different microhabitats that they actually deposit the eggs into. And the females have got a scythe-like ovipositor, which basically cuts into the, the outer tissue of the tree and the bark. And they pump a whole heap of eggs into there. It'll lay a certain quantity into each groove, so there'll be a sequence of grooves. If you look at the stem later, you'll see where the tree's got a zip-like opening along it with small breaks in between where the eggs are. And then the eggs take a couple of weeks to hatch. It varies again between the species, but I'm just talking on average. Then you've got these tiny little cicada nymphs. They're really small, and they make their way down to the soil and they burrow in and that's where the life cycle begins again once they've found a plant roots to uh, tap into and, and start their life cycle. What a beautiful and incredibly complex life cycle that is and also an incredibly important part of the food chain. Yes, um, there's a lot of bird predation from cicadas. They, they have a bit of a field day when they're out. Particularly the migratory birds when they come down from Southeast Asia and New Guinea they must think that Australia is, you know, it's just, just cicada heaven because, you know, they, they arrive in the summer and, and then Australia's full of cicadas and they just hawk around getting free food everywhere. Do they make good eating? Oh, that's, that's, um, you're the first person to ask me that in an interview and I'm happy to say that people do eat them in different parts of the world. They'll make all sorts of things, cicada kebabs. And I actually ran into a, a guy in Australia near Glen Innes, uh, who was running around rampantly collecting cicadas just as they were coming out of their shells and saying, this is, this is the only time to get them because they're nice and soft and he was going to make a stroganoff. A cicada stroganoff. That's right. Yummo. One thing that I do have to point out is the difference in pronunciation between how you say cicadas and I say cicadas. And I'm pretty sure this goes along state lines in Australia. It could be true. A lot of people um, in Victoria and New South Wales say cicada. It does depend on regional accents. I think in the US, uh, most accents say cicada as well. So, um, yeah, it just depends on where you're from and what you're used to. Now, the greengrocer, what a wonderful and intriguing creature, but of course not the only species of cicada. How many do we have in Australia? Described species, the number is, it goes up fairly often because we're still in the process of discovering and describing a lot of the species, but it's above 250 now, heading towards 300. The actual estimate, and hopefully I'll be speaking for most of the cicada researchers when, when I say this, because it seems to be the, the estimate that's agreed upon at the moment, 700 to 1,000 species. So that means that only around a third of the species in Australia have been identified and named. And I have to say, the entomologists do have some fun with the names. For example, the aptly named TikTok. The alarm clock squawker. Brace yourselves for this one. The coastal whiner. The fishing reel buzzer. The rapid ticker. You might not be able to hear that, it's so high pitched and fast. Let me slow it down and lower the tone. And the sprinkler squeaker. Wait for it. There you go. I think golden twang is a nice call to, to hear. It's quite distinctive. I gave it that name because if you, if you listen to the song, it's got quite a strong twang-like change in each, each of the phrases. And then also it's got the sort of strange raspberry that comes after it, um, after a series of twangs. And, and that gives it a really distinctive and unusual sound. Okay, so twangs and raspberries. Can you hear them? Let's break it down. 
twang, twang, raspberry, twang, raspberry, twang, raspberry. And then at full pace again. On top of that, there's a whole group of cicadas called the double drummers. Yes, yeah, so the double drummers got an, quite an amazing s- song. It's very electric. It's got strong modulating and pulsing elements to it. It's like an electric saw. A real high, high-end wine. It, it's very metallic. Um, it's about as loud as they get. The eastern double drummer is Australia's largest cicada, about five centimetres or a bit bit over that in body length. And they're also a very, very wide cicada. In fact, another species of double drummer, I think, has the widest head of any Australian insect. Um, So they're, they're a chunky beast. They do look like a little bit of a buff head. I have to say, I was looking them up on the internet in preparation for this interview, and they are a sight to behold. Yes, they're pretty spectacular uh, with their real reddish-brown coloration, and some of the species have white markings, others have black markings. In fact, another name for the eastern double drummer is a Union Jack because of the distinctive markings on the thorax. So. And this is just one eastern double drummer trying to drum up some female attention. It's an absolutely obnoxious sound for us. The sound is so dense, I did a count, and it has about 220 or more pulses per second. Per second. It's so dense. It's like a wall of sound. I have to slow it down so much just so that you can hear the pulses. And actually, each one of these pulses you can hear is actually two pushed closely together amazing creatures. A lot of Australia has double drummers. The eastern double drummer, the desert double drummer, the orange drummer, which is a mini double drummer. So there's quite a few double drummers out there now. Does it also make you feel slightly like you're researching in a Dr Seuss novel? I like that aspect of it, I think. You know, we like to do things that are unique and and interesting in life, and and I guess as cicadas are what's really grabbed me. You know, as you grow up, you, you basically are drawn to certain things. And as someone interested in natural history from a young age, guidebooks were very interesting. I was on a field trip with another person who's now a colleague of mine as well, uh, studying cicadas, and I knew that he was trying to track down this cicada that was just making this sound just like a watch. It was like tick, 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 really sharp ticking sound. I thought, this this is incredible. I chased that cicada around in a small bunch of bushes for about an hour, and um, that sort of got me hooked. The clincher was the moment when I came back to Brisbane and then found that same species, which is a new species and a new genus that had never been found and identified before. That same cicada that I found out west, I found in the local park. That's one we call the eastern ticker. It's a very small cicada. Its body length is about a centimetre. I'm glad I got onto it when I was young because I can't hear it anymore in the field. Why is that? The song is too high-pitched. So for young people, children, teenagers, you know about these mosquito ringtones that they have on their phones. The whole point of that is that uh, the parents can't hear that, but the kids can. And it's the same thing with these really small cicadas with their high-pitched songs. It's very hard for um, people, once they're older than 20, to be able to detect those sounds. Human hearing goes up to about 20 kilohertz when you're first born. Some, Some people go a little bit higher than that even. But as we age, hearing deteriorates, so particularly those higher frequencies. But apparently uh, women, on average, I believe, tend to um, retain their hearing better than men. Do you find that the calls are beautiful? I think it is interesting to me musically, in a sense. But I think, I think the main alluring thing about cicadas is Yes, recording them, that's really, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. But also the thrill of the hunt of hearing something I've never heard before and then tracking it down and then starting the problem solving of, all right, where do you fit into the puzzle? (laughs) It's still the age of discovery from my point of view um, in terms of cicada biology. 
flowery bakers, black princes, whiners, drummers, grinders, ringers, clickers, cherry noses, coincidentally also called whiskey drinkers, and green grocers. I hope you've enjoyed your introduction to Cicada Song today and a huge thank you to Dr Lindsay Popple, entomologist and sound recordist for this episode. I'm Ann Jones and you've been listening to RN's Off Track.